I made a video earlier this week about the uh, some idle quality concerns uh, on this uh, Ford F-250. It was actually in response to a commenter on my channel that had an F-250 with a 460 V8, whereas this F-250 had the 351. But the uh, concepts were just the same. And I had another commenter that uh, also had uh, a question about some idle quality concerns, except that his truck is uh, not fuel injected at all but carbureted. And uh, I figured uh, that the best way to answer some of his questions would be to um, make another video and actually talk about uh, carburation. And uh, instead of using this truck as an example, because it's fuel injected, I'll go ahead and use the uh, 72 Lincoln in here. In the garage, parked nice and safe. Keep away from all the nasty snow and everything that's melted so far. But um, first of all, um, since it's carbureted, it's going to have a... His problem is, is that the uh, engine will go up to about uh, 2,000 RPM and uh, stay that way for a long time before it kicks on down to idle speed. And uh, I'll try to provide some... Uh, it's hard to diagnose problems uh, without actually looking at it, but I'll try to provide some um, practical advice. Um, right here I've got a... Uh, 360 four barrel intake off of a uh, 360 V8 from a Plymouth Grand Fury police car from uh, I think 1985 and um, one of the reasons, I just wanted to have this sitting out so I can kind of talk about it, one of the reasons why you would want to choke an engine and have a slightly higher idle speed is because um, particularly in the case of this Lincoln where it's not driven all that much, especially in the snow, um, and they sit for a long time, all the passages inside the intake manifold are just bone dry. Just as dry as this intake manifold is. And this man manifold is actually pretty cold. It's cold out here, about maybe 35 degrees right now. And um, what happens is, as you go to um, pump the pedal a couple of times and drop some gas down in here, well that gasoline actually condenses on the inner surfaces of the intake manifold and can't make it, can't quite make it all the way down to the individual runners. Especially in manifolds like this where it's a dual plane manifold where you've got one runner on top of the other. And so as the farther away you get from the carburetor, the worse the problem is, the, the cylinders, especially way back here in the back, tend to actually run lean. They're starred for fuel. So what happens is, is you have to have a choke on the carburetor air horn to uh, make the mixture very rich. So you dump a lot of gas in here um, just to get the engine started. And then eventually the choke should open up and the mixture should return to normal once the intake manifold reaches temperature and the fuel is no longer condensing on the inner surfaces. You've got a much better mixture now. On this manifold, the choke <coughs> would actually sit here and um, control the carburetor in this little passage. <coughs> and to um, help out, this is not true in the Ford case, but on the Chrysler's at least, uh, to help out, sometimes the chokes would have an electric heater in here to uh, help warm the choke up. Um, on almost all cars of this era, um, to help the um, manifold warm up, they're going to have an exhaust crossover passage, which is right there. You got your two intake ports that side and two intake ports on that side, and then a crossover port right here. And that runs all the way through the manifold, under the carburetor area, and out the other side. In this case, um, this car had a uh, EGR, exhaust gas recirculation, where some of this exhaust would be back fed back up in the intake manifold here and here to um, reduce the peak flame temperature. But this actually allows you to see that exhaust crossover. So as the engine's warming up, you've got hot exhaust gases traveling through here, 
heating up where the carburetor is and actually heating up the intake manifold. You've got an electric choke as well too to uh, help speed things along to uh, start letting that choke open up more and more. And you've also got your coolant passages here that to some degree help the manifold warm up but it takes a long time. And um, one of the things you need to look out for, especially on an older vehicle like this, is these exhaust crossover passages tend to get plugged up with carbon and everything. And um, there's really no way to tell if it's plugged up or not. Um, there's not really a good way to measure how quickly the intake manifold is supposed to warm up. There's not really any specification for it. You pretty much have to pull the intake manifold off and just do an inspection like this and just make sure that you can go all the way across the manifold like this. Having plugged exhaust crossover passages like this is um, one reason why um, your choke, at least in the case of the uh, Ford 460, it might be one reason why the choke is taking a long time to pull off. Depending upon what year the uh, 460 is, it may or may not have an electric choke. This Lincoln Continental actually is a uh, 1972 Lincoln Continental, so it's pretty old. <coughs> and uh, it does have the uh, 460 V8. And there's the Autolite 4300 carburetor. I actually rebuilt that about maybe seven years ago. And I just wanted to use this engine to sort of demonstrate what the Ford 460 would look like since the commenter had a 460 in this truck so hopefully these engines are uh, close to the same model year. He didn't say what year model his truck was. Um, sorry for the lighting it's kind of bad. This car doesn't have an electric choke. They may have used electric chokes in the later years but certainly not in uh, 1972. But it does kind of have, and you can't really see very well, that same kind of area that the Chrysler manifold had down in there. And it's got these two tubes. And um, they're just full of air. And what happens is, is um, this, this car also has an exhaust crossover passage. As hot exhaust gases go across the intake manifold, they not only heat up the intake manifold where the carburetor is, they also heat the air that's going to these tubes. In particular, this tube right here I'm pointing out with my finger. And as the air in this tube heats up, there is a bimetallic spring in this choke housing that um, reacts to that temperature and expands and closes the choke. Right now, it's actually under quite a bit of tension because this engine is very cold. The car hadn't been driven in about a month. So when I uh, go to step on the gas, this choke is going to close. So that's how this car um, operates as far as how it closes its choke. And because it doesn't have an electric heater like the Chrysler did, uh, I guess that's just too old, the exhaust crossover passage being clear <coughs> is much more important on uh, this car. Because that's the only source of heat really that we have for the air inside that tube to get inside the uh, choke housing here. Um, so that'd be one thing to check for. That's going to be harder to uh, really do because you got to pull the intake manifold off to really get a good look at it. That would not be the first thing I'd do because of that because that's a lot of work. This intake manifold is cast iron and it's very heavy. Um, Another possibility, which is probably very obvious, and which uh, has probably already been checked, is just to check for the free operation of the choke assembly. Make sure these rods on the carburetor are not bent and binding up. Make sure the shaft is nice and free. The shafts are actually te Teflon coated, that's why they're green. You don't want to take this out and sand it or anything like that. You'll rub the coating off of there. Just make sure nothing's binding up. And um, the other thing is, as you can see, 
you can adjust it by turning this plastic housing clockwise and counterclockwise to adjust your spring tension. And on the housing right there, you can see that little dent, there's a mark. And then on the uh, metal for the carburetor, you've got these notches. And what you can do is you can line up this mark with these notches. And it's uh, there's actually a specification in the manual about um, which notches you should be using according to what climate you live in to adjust the uh, leaner richness of the choke. If you've got this um, adjusted to the point where you've got too much spring tension on there, it's going to make that choke stay closed for a lot longer period of time than it really should, which means that the engine is going to have to run that much longer to make enough heat to counteract that spring force and close the choke back down. As you can see in this car, um, since, since I live in a fairly warm climate, although you wouldn't know it by the winter we just had, you can see that notch is actually beyond specification and it's not even matching up with the notches on the carburetor itself. So I've got this choke actually set pretty lean. Um, I don't like the idea of uh, having the engine run way on up there in RPM ranges when it's cold like that, especially since the uh, car is not driven every day. It's driven usually at least once every two weeks, but um, unfortunately because of the winter time and all the snow we've had, I've not driven it for a long time, <clears throat> for about a month now. There's no way I'm driving this thing in the snow. And what I usually do is I'll wait for the snow to melt, of course. And then I'll also wait after a couple of rains. That way all the salt that's left on the roads is washed off. Then I'll start driving it again. So it's been quite a while. And because of that, when I start the engine up, um, it just goes barely off idle almost. It might go to maybe uh, 800 RPM or 900 RPM. And, uh, quickly come back off the choke because of the way that I have it set there. And I'll just sit in the car and just use my foot to hold the gas open. It's not that big of a deal. Um, I have driven the car every day for about a week. And um, it, that setting actually works out pretty good for me. I can just put the key in the ignition and start it right up. And it actually starts up and runs just like a fuel injected car, believe it or not. Uh, carburetors really aren't all that bad. What makes people hate carburetors so much is they're a little bit tricky to adjust and you got to keep on top of them. You got to keep all these things lubricated, make sure nothing's bent and debris and stuff like that hadn't gotten in here to bind anything up, but they're actually very reliable and your engine can run really good with a carburetor. So, um, those are pretty much the things that I would check. Uh, I would check first to make sure your choke is free to operate. I would all, and then I would check to uh, make sure your choke adjustment is correct. I would start backing off on that spring tension little by little to see if the engine will come off that 2000 RPM idle speed more quickly. I would also check to see if this tube is getting warmer and warmer uh, as the engine is started up. If this tube takes a long time to get warm, then I would suspect that your exhaust crossover patches is clogged up. Um, and that's going to be a little bit of work. You're going to have to pull the distributor off, drain the cooling system, take out the carburetor, and pull this intake manifold off, which is uh, kind of back-breaking on a 460 because everything about this engine is big. It's all cast iron. It's a very heavy motor. But um, on a car this old, especially uh, with leaded gas, I'm sure that exhaust crossover passage is plugged up, but... It's not that cold around here, so I really don't have to uh, worry too much about the engine um, staying at high idle for long periods of time. So um, hopefully uh, this kind of answers a lot of the questions you've had and uh, can uh, save you some money. Uh, those are just the things that I would look out for. Uh, maybe somebody else watching uh, can think of some things that I haven't thought of. And... Uh, come up with some other ideas. I mean, who knows, you might be able to uh, retrofit a, uh, an electric choke heater to these cars if they make them. If, if Ford made them in later years, you might be able to retrofit that on there. Or you might be able to 
take this apart, take these tubes out of here and make sure the tubes aren't plugged up somehow. There's no fluid or anything going through here. It's just air, but who knows? Maybe some spider webs got built in there and clogged them up or mud daubers or something else. But uh, that's basically how the whole thing works. It's not really terribly complicated, but uh, just uh, wanted to give some tips on uh, how to solve that problem.